the whole remote work thing is something for people with white collar jobs and college educations. There aren't many opportunities for everybody else. And when you sort of look at what's been going on with real estate markets is you have all these people who probably felt pretty poor in Silicon Valley or New York, but are now among the richer people out in some distant suburb or smaller city where they've moved. And their buying in is making it harder for people in those places who are just making local incomes and can't work remotely to uh, afford housing. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. The housing market's been pretty nuts recently. It was definitely very nuts during COVID, where you had this situation in which lots of people all of a sudden were working from home and looking for more space. Now, I should be clear when I'm talking about like the class profile of those people. These are people with relatively affluent means of some disposable income. These were people that often had white collar jobs, jobs in, you know, things like advertising or communications or office jobs where they were able to remote work, lawyers, etc. Um that is a relatively small slice of American households just to keep all of this in perspective, but this huge crunch for space sent housing markets in a lot of places that were rural or suburban into complete totally haywire. And that happened right around the lockdown. Then the housing market kind of got frozen in place and cooled. And then as people came out of lockdown, we've seen housing prices going bonkers all over the country as we have all this kind of pent-up demand. And of course, it's always hard to know what to make of that. I mean, at one level, it's very complex, the housing market. It's incredibly, as we learned from the 2007, 2008, it's very bound up with government policy, with interest rate environment. It's also hugely important to the lived experience of American citizenry, integration, climate change. And yet it often gets covered sort of only on the business pages. And I thought it was a really good moment to think and talk about housing after COVID because we're, we're in a new moment now. We just had this incredibly disruptive experience that changed people's daily work habits and patterns. Some of that I think is gonna stick around. Some of it will probably have enduring effects on the housing market and housing planning, urban planning, housing development going forward. And someone who I've been reading forever is Justin Fox, who's a columnist at Bloomberg Opinion. He's the author of a great book uh, that I really recommend from years ago called The Myth of the Rational Market. He's been writing about COVID and housing and a few different articles. He wrote about Orlando becoming less affordable than San Francisco, which is a, a surprising result, I think, for a lot of folks, um, writing about millennials and their housing purchases. So Justin Fox, great to have you on Why Is This Happening? Great to be here. So, Justin, maybe let's just start off this way. Where was the housing market? You know, we had obviously the huge, you know, notorious bubble and boom of 04 through 07. We had the unbelievable crash. It took a very long time. I know someone who, for instance, was telling me about a condo he bought for like $135,000 at the peak at like 2006. And it went down to 39000 at the trough. And now it was like back to 95,000, like just as a as as one piece of property and, and a sense of that. But where was the housing market before we hit COVID? I mean, I think in places like especially the Bay Area, but also New York, other coastal metros, it was very strong. Um, and it had never collapsed quite the way it had in like Arizona or Las Vegas or uh, the Rust Belt. But, you know, overall, the U.S. housing market was in a pretty good place. The homeownership rate was rising steadily. Prices were going up, but so were incomes in most places. Again, you know, in the Bay Area, the prices seem to be going off in some crazy place, although incomes are really high there, too. So it was, I think in most ways, it was a healthy housing market, except that, I mean, the thing that people in, you know, used to define it as healthy was basically that there weren't any dodgy loans going on, meant that, you know, most people had to have pretty big down payments. So it was pretty affluent people who were the only ones able to buy housing, except in really cheap places. We also have this sort of perennial situation, which we'll get to sort of afterwards, but just to set the, you know, context for before COVID is that it's been a real failure of a lot of 
liberal Democratic Party controlled cities. San Francisco is like the most obvious, but a lot in creating affordable housing and particularly in having housing supply meet demand to keep prices at, you know fairly stable. That that has been a perennial challenge in those places, and we've seen really high housing prices, right? Yeah, and I mean, I will say, like San Francisco proper, the city did better than a lot of places, but most of the suburbs around it did a terrible job. And yeah, I, you know, in the end, supply and demand doesn't explain everything in the world, but it's pretty clear that the reason why housing prices didn't go up as much in, say, Texas as they did in California is that they kept building lots more housing in Texas. And part of that is just pure geography. I mean, a lot of these places that are very, you know, haven't built enough housing have a bunch of constraints that make it hard for them to do it. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, there was this thing going on in the U.S. and really around the world for the past 30, 40 years where sort of the economic effects, like benefits to agglomeration, especially for what they call knowledge workers, were getting higher and higher, having lots and lots of people with these skills in technology, in media, in other things, in one place seemed to pay off in a big way. And so there were more and better jobs in those places that concentrated lots of people like that, like, again, the Seattle area, the Bay Area, New York, um, and, you know, Austin, Texas, Raleigh, Durham. But in most of those places, there was not nearly enough new housing going up. And in many cases, not the appropriate kinds of housing. It's like, I think we've been better over the past decade at building one-bedroom apartments mm -hmm. and big four-bedroom houses and not a whole lot in between. Hmm. One of the things that we see happen, you know, there's this kind of YIMBY movement, yes, in my backyard, that's uh, pushing for uh, a few things. One is uh, zoning reform to get rid of really strict zoning that, for instance, doesn't allow like two or three unit houses, right? Like, a, you know, a, and we're not talking <laughs> 60 story office towers. We're talking about like, can you build, you know, can you build a house in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, that has uh, two stories, one sort of one condo kind of thing or one rental unit on each one. And a lot of places, it's just illegal to build that. It's very hard to build that kind of housing. And one of the things I keep coming back to on this sort of supply constraint is that the fundamental thing to understand about housing and politics, particularly in urban environments specifically, but even, you know, Charlottesville is not like super urban, densely urban, is that the material interest of the current homeowner is just different than the people that don't own homes. Right. Like, if you own a home, you are want prices to go up, and you don't want lots of new big housing built around you. And if you don't own a home, you want prices to go down so you can afford to live somewhere. And in some ways, those two material interests are like drive a lot of policy and are kind of incommensurable. Yeah, and in most places, it's the homeowners who have the political power because they're more likely to vote. And just in most places, they're in the majority. Um, and it's, you know, it's always interesting when in a place like New York City where they're not, when the renters get riled up, big things can happen. Right. But they're also like home, you know, we have studies of this, right? They're also like they're less transient, right? I mean, there's a, the shorter life cycle for how long people are around. They tend to get more involved in politics. And again, they have this material stake. I mean, I, you know, I'm a homeowner now. And it's weird because I don't think of my home as an investment chiefly. I think of it just the place we live and it's a place that we can afford to live. But when housing prices grow up or down, I'm like, oh, right, that does, I wonder what that does to the house. Like, you know, this thing that I think of in political terms, which is can people afford to live in New York City, also means something specifically to me and my balance sheet if you're a homeowner. And like, you kind of get the wrong rooting interest, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, you know, if you tell me, well, housing prices went up 15% year over year, like it's a windfall for people that are owning stuff, but it's just brutal for anyone else. Yeah, and I mean, one little side thing that's just sort of unique to the U.S. You know, there are lots of, a lot of other countries with high homeownership rates. What's sort of unique to the U.S. is this obsession with detached single-family homes and this belief that having them near any other kind of housing will reduce the value. Like, there are really nice neighborhoods all over Europe where you've got fancy mansions next to little apartment buildings, and it doesn't seem to hurt right. the value, but that's a, another unique U.S. thing that makes it even harder to do this sort of 
you know, middle, middle housing, the smaller, the two or three unit places you're talking about. And that just hasn't been built at all in the U.S. in, in a couple of decades. It's a big apartment building boom over the past uh, seven or eight years. But again, it was mostly in larger buildings and it was mostly one bedroom apartments. So that's the kind of context. You have this like this sort of lack of this kind of middle housing. You got some supply constraints that you're hitting up against in a lot of metro areas that have been sort of growing through this kind of, you know, agglomeration of college educated white collar workers that are driving, you know, that have very high incomes. Places like Seattle, we talked to Alec McGillis about, you know, his Amazon book, which which talks about this and the effect that, that that's had on the city of Seattle. And then COVID hits. What does COVID do to the housing market? Well, I mean, the initial thing was it sent a bunch of people who were sort of on the edge about living in the city, very, in many cases, like young parents with with their small kids at home, who would probably would have been looking at a place in the suburbs in the next five years. It sent them looking very quickly. <laughs> and I, that was, I think, the first really big thing. And then as as time went on, there was also this realization that remote work was practical for more people than had been thought before. And that led to these booms in places even farther from big cities. And and the thing in all of these, both suburbs, but especially like these little markets like Bozeman, Montana, or I mean, even Boise to some extent, it's pretty big, but it's still not big like the places that people are coming to it from. You have this it's just too many people at once. And so you have the bidding wars and everything else. I mean, another funny factor that Issy Roman, this great housing economist, wrote about a few months ago is that to some extent, this whole the rise of Zillow and other home search technology also just it's now conceivable for somebody to sit at their computer for a couple hours and pick out a house uh, a thousand miles away and buy it. I have no idea what you're... I've never done that. I don't know why you're accusing yeah, but me of people sitting did. on Zillow. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking because, like, I have, like, I, like, a lot of people have, like, a real sickness about this. And, like, sometimes I'll just be, like... I mean, r- literally, like, it'll be, like, I don't know, 11.45 at night. I'll be on my laptop. <laughs> sometimes Kate peeks around. She's like, are you looking at real estate? And it's like, I'm just like what is $600,000 buy in Biloxi, Mississippi? <laughs> and then it's like, a lot, I bet. wow, that's a lot. You can get a lot of house with a pool in Biloxi. Like, huh, what would life be like in Biloxi? Like, it, You'd have to learn to pronounce it Biloxi though. <laughs> yes, that would probably be my first stop, start. <laughs> but it's like the transformation of the house buyer because of the Zillow age is a really interesting thing to consider because, you know, there's that SNL sketch about it that was in COVID. And I think it was a lot of like people stuck in small spaces and daydreaming about larger places. But it has to have really altered consumer behavior to have everything at the touch of a fingertip. Every house that's on the market in America, you could look at right now. (laughs) Right. And that's something that I think is underappreciated and it's hard to measure what role that plays. And and so basically, you know, as the year went on, even as the big cities that had emptied out, people started coming back and, you know, rents have been going up in New York to a lesser extent in San Francisco. I mean, first of all, you still have that imbalance where it's the demand is focused on mostly smaller markets. So that's going to cause prices to rise in more places. But I'm still, I'm struggling to get my head around with what's going on now, which is that prices are basically going up everywhere. And, you know, there are longer term reasons for that. There's this huge generation of people who are several years behind previous generations in things like um, buying a house. Uh, And, you know, there was lots written early on about the unique preferences of the millennials. I think it's become clear and clear. It's just that they were poor. I mean, they came into the workforce at the absolute worst possible time at the end of this awful recession or during it. So on the one hand, there's this huge seeming pent up demand. On the other hand, lending standards have not gotten any looser as a reaction, maybe overreaction to what happened during the housing bubble of the 2000s. And so it's it's not everybody who can participate in this thing. It's you need a pretty big down payment. And and in a lot of these people moving to various lovely places around the country, it's the it's the all cash buyers who are winning. 
Right. So like in a place like Bozeman, right, what you mentioned before, I mean, that that seems like that's an interesting situation because it seems like that's people with a fair amount of money, quite a lot of probably freedom. We're talking about a small group of fairly affluent people. Right. But it doesn't take that many because Bozeman is just not a big real estate market. So you <laughs> like you could pretty much overwhelm that that real estate market and cause all sorts of crazy bidding wars with not that many people just deciding, hey, why don't I live in Bozeman? Yeah. And I think, I mean, that is a lot of it. And I think to some extent, it's caused. I, I, I gotta think some a bunch of these places are gonna have a hangover from that in the coming years. But as with all these things, you just don't know when. So, well, there's also the bigger question here that has to do about with a set of really interesting nested questions about sort of office life in America. We started doing the show completely remotely the first week of lockdown and. A week before that, if you said, we're going to produce and broadcast a live hour of cable news with no one except maybe one or two people in 30 Rock, the host isn't going to be there. The line producer isn't going to be there. I mean, normally the way that our work works is that we come to the office and then everyone goes into the control room. There's a director in the control room. There's an EP, a prompter operator. There are segment producers in there. The booking, everyone's in there. They're all in a McCarty system. They're all talking to each other. I'm in front of a camera. I've got an IFB, which is sound like, like it's all there, right? And and there is very specialized equipment <laughs> that has been created to produce this. We're not like, you know, our work product is not sharing a Google Doc. So we, we got to make this thing. Right. And within a week, we figured out how to do it remotely. And I got to think that that's, I mean, that's, that's happened across all kinds of industries that are going to have all kinds of ramifications going forward about whether people need to come to the office. Yeah. And I mean, clearly they have this value. It's, it's valuable sometimes to hang out with people in person and have informal conversations of a sort, but it, it's, yeah, it, Things should be different. It's one of those classic things. There's the classic story about why it took so long for there to be productivity gains from the arrival of electricity. And it was because initially they just plugged it into existing factories. And it wasn't until they'd redesigned them all that it made a big difference. And sort of with the internet, especially, it's that question of why isn't there been more of a productivity gain? Well, maybe it's because we needed to reorganize how we did work. And maybe this is going to give this, this big push forward. And obviously that has big real estate implications. One thing I keep thinking of is there's this famous paper by um, two economists, Cheng Tai Tse and Enrico Moretti, that it was published in 2019, but I've been making the rounds before. It was this sort of attempt to calculate the economic cost of all the sort of NIMBY things and regulations keeping more housing from being built in places like New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And they came up with this calculation, you know, obviously a lot of assumptions in it, but that it had reduced U.S. GDP by 8.9%. And then actually this year, another economist ran all the calculations and found out they'd made a mistake and it was really 36%. Wow. And so it's like, okay, here's this huge, this thing that's been holding the economy back because we're not able to build enough housing near these job centers. You know, maybe this is an opportunity to get around that at least a little bit. That's, That's a one positive way to view this whole office shift beyond just the fact that some people will not have to go on ridiculous commutes. Um, as many did. Yeah, I mean, those two aspects of of our economic geographic housing life seem just so core to, you know, people, there's jobs. People tend to leave places where there are not a lot of jobs. They tend to go to places where there are jobs and you look at like inflows and outflows. And then, you know, you have to have housing keep up with that. And there's obviously commuting is a huge part of people's lives. There's all kinds of interesting time use surveys about how as housing gets more expensive, people spend more time commuting. And the more time commute they are, the less happy they are controlling for everything else. Like commuting, is <laughs> long commutes is one of the things like most guaranteed to make people miserable. So now you've got this idea of like, yeah, if you can really unlock, and people have been talking about this for 20 years since the dawn of the internet, could really unlock where you live from where you work it could transform everything. I guess the question is, how enduring do we think those changes are going to be? I mean, you know, not as enduring as they look right now, but probably pretty enduring. I mean, I just think it's just shifted and and sort of having it coincide with a labor market situation where the prime age 
population just isn't going to grow much over the next 20 years, barring unforeseen events. You've just got this situation where employers, it seems like a lot of employees like it, and some employers have embraced it. Ones that haven't are probably going to encounter some difficulties. I mean, one thing on a sort of getting beyond the lives of those people, which in many cases are improved, once again, this is maybe 20% of the workforce we're talking about or 30% who are able to do this. The whole remote work thing is something for people with white collar jobs and college educations. There aren't many opportunities for everybody else. And when you sort of look at what's been going on with real estate markets is you have all these people who probably felt pretty poor in Silicon Valley or New York, but are now among the richer people out in some distant suburb or smaller city where they've moved. And their buying in is making it harder for people in those places who are just making local incomes and can't work remotely to uh, afford housing. That's a great point, right? So yeah, so there could be effects in both directions, right? Because to the degree that you're, and again, we yeah, we should, to the, the people we're talking about that, you know, is is a very small sliver. It's 20, you know, 20, 25%, right, of, of the American workforce, maybe. But it's also a part of the workforce that has a lot of weight in terms of like the market power and what it does to both development and politics. The good thing I could see happening is that to the extent that those people are further from the city, like that taking some of the price pressure away from these actual metro urban areas. But then to the extent it does that, like the, you know, just squeezing the balloon, it's going to put more pressure on those smaller localities they might be going to where they're coming in with all cash offers and they, you know, they, they can buy a house for $500,000 in cash in, you know, two hours outside San Francisco, but in San Francisco that, right. you know, they, they couldn't have gotten anything for that price. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, I, I go back and forth between being optimistic and pessimistic about it. It's like, when you think about it, high real estate prices have been like in many ways, the biggest problem of New York City over the past decade or so. Um, And so, okay, great. Maybe they'll be a little bit lower going forward. But it's like they're not going enough lower to really suddenly make, you know, non-rent controlled, non-subsidized housing affordable to like about half of New Yorkers. And then, yeah, it's having these interesting effects elsewhere. Obviously, some of the places where lots of people are moving are places that don't have either the regulatory or physical constraints on building new housing that uh, New York or San Francisco do. So some of them, you know, maybe that will be able to moderate the price increases. Again, not your Bozeman's, but maybe your Phoenix's, your Las Vegas's, uh, Boise and such. Yeah, I don't don't know whether to feel positive about it or not. I mean, one of the the other things that we see broadly, a broad trend is people moving from places that have winter to places that don't have winter. <laughs> right. Basically, the Sun Belt in the Pacific Northwest, obviously, they have winter in the Pacific Northwest. It, like, rains all winter, but they don't, you know, it doesn't get super cold. You know, those are places of population growth. Florida has population growth. Georgia has population growth. Texas, huge population growth. Arizona, Nevada. I mean, Sioux Falls and Fargo have a lot of population growth, too, but it's a pretty small base. And it's very cold there in the winter. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but yes, in general, you're absolutely right. It's And when I did that, I, I think you mentioned before that the column where Orlando came out worse in affordability than the than the San Francisco metro area. That, this was just dividing rent by median income. You know, there's a bunch of places that come off great that are actually, to me, really attractive, like Pittsburgh and Louisville. And I mean, Louisville's not that cold. Birmingham, Alabama. But it, I, I don't get the sense that those places have been experiencing huge booms. I mean, in fact, I think Pittsburgh is really struggling um, over the course of the pandemic. Yeah, Pittsburgh's an interesting story because that's such an incredible town. You know, Pittsburgh has had a very different trajectory than a, the city like Cleveland, um, you know, because of universities and hospitals and like a lot of sort of, you know, 21st century job development that allowed it to kind of escape the fate of a place like Cleveland that had a huge kind of like hollowing out happen. Why was Orlando worse than San Francisco? I mean, I think it's just because it, it's that, you know, I mean, part of it may have, I doubt this was a factor, but I was measuring using apartment lists, latest estimate of apartment rents and some BLS median wage 
from like a year and a half ago. But I, but I, I think in reality, wages haven't gone up that much in Orlando. It's just a bunch of people with money moved there. And, and those, you know, those people will raise the median wage a little bit, but not enough to really make that big a difference. And so, yeah, what's happening is that as more people who can work anywhere move to cheaper places, that puts the squeeze on people in those places who can't work anywhere. And, you know, some of that can't be avoided. And again, a lot of these are places that are still growing and will be able to accommodate that over time. But it is still this interesting, I mean, so much in this country gets, especially analysis of things like this, it's all focused on the most affluent 25% or so of Americans because they're the ones who are subscribing to the various media properties that report about it. Um, I mean, even more so in financial media, it's more like the top 10%. And they make more noise and they just have all this market power. And so it just sort of things that are very positive for somebody who's sort of a mid-level worker in a white collar job. Um, and that's great, but it, they, they do have all sorts of side effects for other people. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how we should think about, you know, where we are in housing now and housing policy and how to make things better for that, you know, the, the, the 75% who is not in that category right after we take this quick break. So you make a great point about how a lot of these housing market dynamics and sort of the, the entire, you know, world of real estate coverage and, you know, all the shows that are on cable television about home remodeling or, or finding the right house, you know, it's, that's a fairly thin strata of Americans that's pitched to. What are things that, that we should be doing uh, to make housing, you know, more accessible, more affordable for, you know, working class people, the working poor, people without, you know, college degrees and white collar jobs? I mean, if I had a simple answer to that, I'd be, I'd probably quit what I do and, or at least spend all my time writing about it. I mean, the, the, you know, the simple answer is build more housing in expensive places, but obviously that, that's hard and those places will still be pretty expensive. So another issue that comes up a lot is, okay, we'll create jobs in less expensive places. And again, you know, maybe there are some new opportunities for that. And clearly there are success stories like Pittsburgh. Although, I mean, the thing with Pittsburgh is it's created a good amount of nice new white collar jobs, but the metropolitan area has kept shrinking and had very little or no job growth for decades. Hmm. So it, it's created this cool new thing and that's great and it may keep growing into more, but it hasn't suddenly made the whole area into this boom town. Well, but then I think part of it too has to do with just like the wage issue, which is that, <laughs> yeah. you know, when you think about, you know, I, I I remember going to, I'll never forget this. I went to interview once an auto worker, tired auto worker in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And just, you know, he'd been a union auto worker his whole life. And I rolled up to his house in Grand Rapids, this beautiful house. And I was, I was fairly young at that point in my career. I was like thinking about writing something about Detroit. I ended up not doing the story. I was actually going to be part of my book. But I had a great day with him and he, you know, gave me lunch and we talked. But I remember just looking at this place being like this. And I was from New York City and I was like, this is the house of like a surgeon in New York. <laughs> yeah. Or this is, you know, and this is a house of an auto worker. And part of it is housing's cheaper in Grand Rapids than New York. Yes. But also like he made a really good living as an <laughs> auto worker, you know, and the equivalent now, which is an Amazon warehouse worker or whatever, like we have created this low wage economy. Uh, that doesn't give people a lot of purchasing power. And so you've got this real bifurcation of, yeah, there's the the, the 20% with college degrees who who live in a fairly constrained set of places where they all feel like, woe is me and poor because in a relative sense, they're competing for these houses where there's not a lot of new supply. And then you've got a huge workforce that just doesn't have a lot of purchasing power, period, because wages have stagnated for decades. Yeah, and I yeah should have mentioned that before. I mean, obviously, inequality is plays a big role in this. If you have bigger distances between people's resources, then it creates these real estate dynamics that are harder for those with less. I mean, one interesting thing is it does seem this sort of wage stagnation has kind of reversed over the last five years or so, Yeah, maybe 10 years. Um, and it's at this point, and, and inequality by most measures has been decreasing since about 2012. 
but it's kind of baby steps at this point. So I, I obviously that's a big part of it. That's a much bigger economic question than just the real estate market. One other thing is, I mean, Grand Rapids is actually one of those places that's sort of at the sweet spot of real estate is still affordable. The economy is growing pretty well. They're attracting a lot of young, educated people, and it's doing really, really well. And maybe it's because, you know, it's not auto workers anymore. It's the people at Herman Miller and Steelcase and stuff and a bunch of other things. But there's somehow or other, there's enough of a working class, middle class to keep that working there. I mean, that to me is that that's the real, like, the nut to crack, right? Is like creating an economy that has a middle class and like, the three things, you know, housing is one of them, but, you know, housing, education, and healthcare, you know, all these things, the big macroeconomic trends of the U.S. is that consumer goods have gotten cheaper and cheaper. We've had the sustained sort of disinflation period from basically 1980 until <laughs> the last few months in which that's changed quite a bit. Uh, it's unclear whether that's temporary or not. But, you know, you've got this period in which consumer goods have gotten cheaper, wages have largely stagnated, inequality has risen, and the three core things that kind of make you feel like a secure middle-class person, which is that you've got, you know, good housing, you've got good health care, and your kids can get educated, have all gone up, you know, crazy amounts in terms of expense. And that, I think, creates this kind of squeeze. The question is, like, housing is one of those triumvirate of goods that you want to create a society in which, like, a lot of people can access as many people as possible, everyone, uh, the security of what, you know, we think of as those kind of, those sort of core goods. Yeah, and I mean, it is interesting because there are definitely a, a bunch of countries with somewhat more equal income distribution and, you know, more equal provision of healthcare and education that still have these crazy housing markets. I mean, like Vancouver or Auckland or London and maybe until recently, Amsterdam. So the housing thing, I think goes beyond just the inequality issue. And when you think about it, in the, in the 19th century, there was this whole, like among economists and social reformers and everything, this idea that land was really scarce and that landowners needed to either have their land taken away from them and have it collectively owned, or they just needed to be taxed really strongly, it was sort of the belief of everybody from Adam Smith on left. And then I think we had this period in the early 20th century where suddenly land wasn't that important. Maybe because uh, new transportation technologies suddenly opened up all this new land around big cities where people could live. And now we're kind of back to that point. And it's like in really in-demand places like New York, you sort of wonder if some of the solutions have to do with, you know, the New York, the housing authority is a mess, but projects like that probably are part of the only way you make housing affordable for people in the bottom third of the income distribution, maybe even the bottom half. And I, I think all of that has been sort of thrown out the window in a lot of countries, not just the U.S., partly because in so many cases it's been mismanaged. But I, I don't know how you get around that. I mean, it, it, like in New York City, at some point, it's a lot of people just can't even afford to pay the rent that would basically pay to keep an apartment maintained and heated and everything else in the city. And yet we need those people in the city. And, and so it, it calls for kind of different ways of thinking about housing than just, gee, let's make sure we have more of it. Well, and it also, I mean, one of the things that I've seen up close, just in my own dealing in real estate markets as a person who is very lucky to have, you know, access to capital and have a very remunerative job you know, it's like a lot of things. It's easier the more money you have. <laughs> you get there's a lot of discounts for being rich. Yeah. You know, like on capital, for instance. I mean, you know, you could get crazy mortgage rates if you're putting a lot of money down and you could get more, you know, exotic mortgage products. Now, again, that kind of stuff was democratized in 2006, 2007 and didn't, didn't lead to a particularly good place, even though, like, it was a mix, I think, of, like, greed, cynicism and some ideological belief that, like, well, access to capital should be democratized and everyone should be able to get a house with 10% down and interest only, you know, yada, yada. But you really do see how much access to capital, having either having it in, in, in savings or in market, you know, liquid investments that you can sell and being approved and the premium on the mortgage you're paying, 
Like all of that just makes an enormous difference in this that just creates different universes for people. And then there's the entire group of people that are renting for whom that's not even an issue, but who are essentially like at the whims downstream of the people that are doing that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any real, it, it's just, you know, life is unfair, unfair and real estate is especially unfair. It seems to sort of <laughs> accentuate whatever disparities and inequalities we have everywhere else. And it seemed like there was this grand kind of, especially, especially post-World War II with the building out of the suburbs, but then yep. in earlier eras in the U.S. with homesteading and other things that at least for some segment of the population, it was like, no, this is this is something everyone can have. There are no limits on it. Yeah. And I don't know that, that that works once a place is developed. Going back to the Pittsburgh, Grand Rapids, wherever, you know, there are places, I'm a big fan of Omaha too, and that's another place that's actually growing. It's pretty affordable. It's a nice place. But they're just all of these places that are places with tons of infrastructure, like a Rochester or a Buffalo or a Cleveland, that, you know, they have tons of super cheap housing, but, you know, pretty limited number of people wanting to move there. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's a lot of places where expensive housing is not the problem. It's just that the, 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 the housing is cheap. It's just there's not jobs and there's not economic dynamism. And those two things are related. That is the thing. It's like, how do you get, yeah, how do you get that middle space? How do you get that sort of Goldilocks situation in which you're, you're growing and you're generating jobs and giving people a shot. Your housing market's not going crazy. And it seems like keeping that equilibrium is really, is a, a difficult thing and some places can do it. But at any one given moment, like a huge amount of places are either on one side or the other of that kind of like, you know, yeah. seesaw. Yeah, the places in the sweet spot are relatively rare. So one of the other big housing stories of the, of the pandemic was the eviction moratorium which put into place by the CDC through its authority. Then there was statutory aspect to it in some of the relief legislation. You know, there was a New York Times story the other day about this landlord in Queens who is, I think, a healthcare worker of some kind, and she rents out this basement apartment, and her tenants are, according to this, <laughs> this according to the perspective of the woman, I think, um, her tenants are terrible, and they're taunting their landlord, and they can't leave. And I was, you know, there was a lot of eye-rolling about that piece. But it does seem to me that, there is some, like, the eviction moratorium made complete sense. I think extending it indefinitely probably doesn't. Eviction's a horrible thing. We should have more affordable housing options. But, like, figuring out what to do next on that front seems a very thorny policy issue. Yeah, and I, I mean, I feel like at some point I, in this discussion, I should mention that I don't cover real estate regularly. Like, eviction's something I've kept thinking I should look into. Right. I write columns on all sorts of different things, and every once in a while, if I feel like there's some data that I think's been ignored or I'm just curious, I jump into it. And I, yeah, eviction, I think it's kind of been this amazing thing that this country has actually been able to do that for a year. But I really don't know where it goes from here. I mean, I, I really like that I think out in California, and I don't know if other places are doing this, the, the state is taking some of its big tax windfall and the money it's gotten from the federal government, and it's actually going to pay the back rent for people so they can stay in their apartments. Yes, that seems like to me like the way to, to square the circle here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like because there's a lot of money to coming to these municipalities and there's a big question of what they're going to do with it. And that seems to me like a way to like the sort of path of least resistance and essentially make everyone whole. If you say like this happened through no fault of anyone's and we didn't want to kick people on the street, good. But forcing landlords to subsidize that because of a pandemic, you can change policy, but that doesn't seem particularly justified. So like, if you have the money, just like smooth it all out that way. Well, and I mean, that's sort of the issue in general with providing below market cost housing is if you think about it in broader economic terms, it's always got to be better for everybody to chip in, in with tax dollars and use that to subsidize. But the sort of reality is that those subsidies generally don't survive for long. And it's totally understandable that tenants in places like New York favor something like rent control, which it's sort of asking landlords to shoulder this affordable housing burden that the city as a whole, its inhabitants as a whole are not willing to do. And, you know, some landlords have made tons of money and can totally do it. And many others sort of bought into the market you know, in full knowledge that they would have this restriction on their incomes. Right. But it it's still when it it's not 
the most efficient way to do it. It it does seem to be the most durable way to do it, which is why it survives. Whereas most subsidized housing programs, sort of, you know, right now we're at this moment where there's a bunch of money and also this sort of general feeling that people who encountered misfortune over the past year and a half, you know, the usual narratives of it being their own fault uh, aren't as strong as they usually are in the U.S. Yes. Um, and, and so it's this sort of unique moment, but, you know, I it, it wouldn't count on it being that way every year for the next 20. You know, prices and housing matter a lot to people, but it's just one one component of cost of living. And, and I thought maybe we could just talk a little bit about a, another adjacent macroeconomic issue, which is, you know, the inflation debate right now. You know, we've seen consumer price index, which is the metric we use to measure inflation, has gone up really big amounts. Then there's a lot of interesting debates about whether we're entering some new, more inflationary period, and that's dangerous, or that it's transitory because when you unpack the data, you see like, oh, you know, airfares are up 83% year over year. Well, of course they are. <laughs> no one's flying last year. Yeah. Used cars and automobiles because a lot of the factories shut down. There was like a weird chip shortage uh, coming out of Japan. And then you had this situation where there was basically no demand and no one working in car factories for a while. And then all of a sudden people want to buy cars. They have disposable income. And then, yeah, the rental car companies sold much of their fleets. And one other interesting thing is there have been far fewer repossessions of cars, um, which usually flow into that market. Oh, that's interesting. And that and I guess that's because yeah. uh, because of the COVID relief that people have. Yeah. Been, yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. When you tell people the United States had, in some ways, like the biggest fiscal response to COVID of peer countries, people think you're lying or that's crazy or like we didn't do anything. But in percentage GDP terms, it's true. Now, it's not quite apples to apples because other countries already have automatic stabilizers through their social safety net that were doing a lot of work that we don't have. So we had to like, just like write a bunch of checks much more. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, definitely other countries were able to direct it in a better way, but in terms of just the overall, you know, as a share of the economy and also, yeah, just the generosity to most individuals. The, the whole thing is some people didn't get anything, but for those who got stuff, uh, it was pretty generous um, setup, not just by U.S. standards, but globally which is a remarkable thing. And again, I think it's partly that you suddenly had, you know, a Democratic Party that wants to do this and then a president who was nominally a Republican but didn't really care about any of the old Republican stuff about not giving money away. Yeah, he didn't, he wanted to get reelected and I think he thought that, like, that yeah. would help him. <laughs> like, more specifically. Yeah, and so, I mean, and who knows how much of this stuff lasts. I mean, I think the new checks for families with kids that are going out now is just so long over to in the U.S. And I think it's a really good thing that actually is really an investment in the future more than anything else, because if children don't grow up in poverty, they usually end up generating more tax dollars later, if you want to focus it that way. So I had run through the kind of inflation stories and the, the more permanent era of inflation versus the sort of transitory. And I'm just curious where you are on that and the people that you talk to, where they are. I mean, I'm mostly on the transitory side. And again, this is not something I cover every day, but I spent a couple days a few weeks ago looking at, you know, there's so much focus on the 70s inflation because people can remember it and it was bad. But the two bigger, at least sharper episodes of inflation were right after World War II and right after World War I. And it feels like in a lot of ways, this is more like those than it is like the 70s things because right. it's very much about an economy suddenly having to, after having done one thing, suddenly having to shift very quickly to something else. People having to be repurposed to different jobs and lots of shortages, lots of people suddenly being able to live live their lives as they wanted after several years of privation and rationing and whatever else. And those both, they were huge inflation, but then they went away. I mean, the, the 20s one was kind of a disaster. The Fed about halfway through it, decided to crack down and ended up with one of the steepest recessions in history, although it ended very quickly. In the 40s, it was there wasn't much Fed reaction at that point. They were still sort of under orders from the Treasury Department to keep rates on various durations of Treasury securities at certain levels. And they finally got rid of that a few years after World War II, but they mostly, mostly held back. And, you know, there was the inflation, then a bit of a dip, 
And then it was kind of okay. There was another little episode during the Korean War. And, you know, like a lot of people at Bloomberg, I'm obsessed with the, you know, lumber futures. And um, they went up like crazy. And now they've gone back to basically not abnormal levels at all. Still a little high. And so that's clearly this case of that was transitory. I think that's what it's going to be in most things. But I mean, the way it works in our modern world is we're not, it's not that we're going to go back to the prices we had before the pandemic. It's just the prices will stop rising in most things. So I, I, I'm not super worried about it, but I totally get that if, man, if you need a, to rent a car or buy a used car right now, inflation's really bad. Yeah, I don't want to sort of downplay it. It's just that the fear of inflation and the Fed's actions and the Volcker when he was Fed chair, you know, in the late 1970s and kind of very famously essentially waterboarded the economy um, yeah. to, to, to sort of bring inflation down, you know, initiate a recession. There's lots of people who look at that as a kind of like dawn of the peak sort of neoliberal era, Reagan, Thatcher, you know, huge crackdowns on labor power, views of labor power as being the source of inflation. Inflation is a kind of tip of the spear for sort of a war on a more equitable economy. And I think there's like fear about that now, but it also seems to me that, you know, even when like the the politics of it, of the, the Republican Party saying, you know, look at Chipotle, they're raising their wages to $15 and you're going to have to pay more for a burrito. And it's like, well, but you're also saying you don't want the, those people to make $15. And I'm not that clear which side is the better side of that argument. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like it, it's totally understandable for people to worry about this and things could go wrong. But I also think the bulk of the, oh my God, it's the 70s over again, is mostly just political, you know, hackdom. People just saying whatever you say to make the current regime look bad, even though we would be having this exact same inflation um, under a Republican president, too. I mean, it's just this is what is happening. I mean, I may be a little less because there wouldn't have been that stimulus. The one in when was that March passed? But I doubt it would have made much difference. The way I think about it a lot is if you're in the subway and a train for some reason, you know, doesn't come because it got held up <laughs> and what happens is, you know, over enough time, the platform has twice as many people as should be there for the train to come. <laughs> so when they come, and that's cascaded down the entire line. So now, twice as many people try to get in this train, which cannot accommodate them. So some people stay back. And then that train, when it goes to the next stop, is completely packed. And it just works itself out after a while. <laughs> but, the, you know, for the first, the first period, it's like we have these kind of like traffic jams that are representing themselves at higher prices. And, you know, it, it sucks right now, but I do think it'll work itself out. And I, I think, you know, maybe the sort of place to end here is like, I do think there's, you know, news about this infrastructure bill. You talked about the fact that actually we saw some wage growth. We saw particularly wage growth at the bottom in 18 and 19 that came from, I think, to... J. Powell's credit, like, partly came from a Fed running the economy hot. Um, and again, Donald Trump wanted to get reelected and jawboning Jay Powell about that because he wanted the economy to run hot. Yep. And, you know, running an economy hot, getting that unemployment rate low, you start to see more worker power, you got to start to see wages go up. In some cases, I think you see people are more, you know, think about unionization more when they have a little more worker power and leverage. But the big question for me is like, can we get back to that on the other side of COVID so that we have an economy where we really are seeing wages rise and we're seeing more worker power in a sustained fashion for a few years? I think yes, in part because sort of the scale of the relief efforts during COVID mean that most of the things that usually happen during recessions didn't happen. Lots of people lost their jobs, that's for sure. But almost all the other metrics of people's assets and you know how much money they have saved and almost everything else held up. And, and like I talk about the cars being repossessed, things held up pretty well. And I think that's part of what's going on in the labor market right now is people aren't as desperate as they usually are coming out of a recession. They can sit around and think about it a little bit. You know, obviously that's very frustrating for some business owners, but I feel really good about the next five or 10 years in the economy. But, you know, who knows? But it just feels like, sort of we bottomed out at some point around 2008, 2009 recession. And because it was so bad, 
a lot of the economic indicators sort of kept slumping for a couple of years after that. But in so many things that had basically all the things that had been either declining or going up since 1980, a lot of them reversed hmm. right around 2012. I mean, really simple one is just manufacturing's share of employment, which had been going down, 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 and then it just plummeted. It fell pretty steadily during the 2000s, even when the economy was growing, and then just plummeted during the recession. And that's generally been on an upward trend. And you know, obviously, everything dropped during the the recession. But eh. sort of the interesting thing, though, is whether the housing market can can be a positive part of all that, too, right. or will keep being. Because one of the things that's kind of interesting is the homeownership rate kind of skyrocketed for a couple of quarters there during 2020 in what I think turns out to be totally just a artifact of the survey taking and the fact that people who didn't own homes were less likely to respond to the current population survey, which is what they get that from. And it's basically back in the first quarter, back to trend or even a little bit below what it had been before the pandemic. And so it's kind of interesting after this, all these people buying houses, homeownership maybe hasn't gone up. Justin Fox is columnist of Bloomberg Opinion, author of The Myth of the Rational Market. He writes about macroeconomic issues, including housing. Justin, it's great to have you in the program. It was a pleasure talking to you. Once again, great thanks to Justin Fox, columnist of Bloomberg Opinion. You can find all of his articles there at Bloomberg Opinion. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to NBCNews.com slash Why Is This Happening. 